Ireland. Hello and welcome to the Dawn Jarvis Show where our goal is to inspire you by interviewing a diverse range of leaders and entrepreneurs and sharing their entrepreneurial journey. Today we have a very special guest, Lalette Hudson, who is sharing her journey into entrepreneurship, how she turned her idea into reality and the importance of sharing stories. Lalette is a multi-award winning inventor, transitional coach, and she works with African and Caribbean high level leaders and entrepreneurs and helps them to turn their ideas into reality and increase their influence, impact and profitability. Hello, Lolette. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Tim, this morning. How are you? Fabulous. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I really <laughs> appreciate you being here. Oh, it's so wonderful um, to have you here this morning. And we've been talking a little bit this morning already. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this. Um, one of the first questions I ask is, how did you get to be where you are today and being a multi award winning inventor? Passion, motivation, commitment, hard work, sweat, and everything else that goes with it. But, you know, to be serious, it's about vision. It's really having a vision. I made a decision um, in 2000 that I wanted to work for myself and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make change. I want to transform education. And so for me, I decided to work in schools with boys that weren't engaging with education effectively. And so I created a space for them to come and share their aspirations and be with like-minded people. So the reality of that was breakfast club which starts at eight o'clock in the morning, which gives them the opportunity to be accountable and be responsible and really understand what ownership is all about. You know, they own their education, own their future and being clear about where they're going next. So this is the type of things that we teach them in the breakfast club. And that was just amazing. You know, turn their aspirations, their ideas and really understand what the whole world of work is like. Because I think sometimes we need to have alternative education because not everybody, you know, learn the same way. We learn differently. And that school was very innovative in their thinking, which enables them to create a space for these young boys to be able to learn differently to the ordinary education that they would have in everyday situation, if that makes sense. It makes absolute sense and it's and I know that education is really important to you and you really made a difference to those um, boys lives what gave you the idea and um, you weren't always an entrepreneur were you so what did you do before that and what, what helped you to move into doing the be breakfast clubs? I think you know the reality is we as individuals from a very young age you know I was brought up in a community in Jamaica and entrepreneurship has always been around me. We don't have a welfare state, so everybody had to create. If it's not there, you had to put it there and enable yourself to thrive in that, in that environment. So everyone was thinking about what they're going to do next, what they're going to create. So there is that whole mindfulness of what you're going to create. And so entrepreneurship to me is in my blood. You know, it's everything I see around me. My grandmother's never worked for anyone. You know, she always creates whatever she needed to create. She never worked for anyone. And so I grew up on that. And I came to the UK and it's the same mentality for me. I say to people, when I wake up in the morning, I work for myself. I might be going to a job, but I work for myself. I dress how I want to dress. I operate how I want to operate. And things have to work for me in the context of whatever job it is, whether I'm cleaning, whether I'm at the top of a corporate, whatever it is, I work according to what works for me. And that's the thing for me about being an entrepreneur is that you realize to yourself, you get to serve and make a difference and solve problems in that sense. That's really inspirational. And you obviously took a lot of inspiration um, from your grandmother. Um, you are really about telling stories. How important are telling stories to you? Storytelling is very powerful because that's how we pass down our values. This is how we empower the people to stories. And when you think about growing up, we all buy so many storybooks in order to empower ourselves and our children 
And you know, stories is a oral tradition. And so we have to be mindful of the stories that we pass down. You know, some stories are empowering, some stories isn't. Because, you know, the story could be that Black people are a particular way, and that story being reinforced in a, in a family. Or it could be white people are a particular way, and that story is passed down through the family. And until, you know, I mean, I remember meeting a lady, she was from um, Scotland, and she said she, in all her life, she's never met a black person, you know, because there's no one in her district in that sense. So the reality is there's a story that's been told to her about how black people are up. And then she came down to London. And so she had to relearn everything she knew and heard about black people, because the reality is what her generation is, what her family told her. So we have to look at the stories. Some stories are no longer relevant, you know, it might have been okay 20, 40, 50 years ago, but it's not relevant now because times have changed. So we need to be mindful about stories. So for example, stories around associations as well. You know, so imagine if there was no London Bridge. Imagine if there was no House of Parliament. Imagine if there was no stories that really reinforced British history in the sense of you know, this is how World War I was, there's World War II. So all those stories have been kept in existence. You go to the British Museum and you will see how people used to live. So it's important to understand those lived experience are captured in stories. You know, and now we're in the digital age, you know, we need to capture them and keep them that we never lose them. And you also talk about um, the importance of the Windrush generation and how we capture those stories. And, um, you know, that's a bit, you know, we share a, um, a heritage and a culture around that. And um, tell me a little bit about, you know, how important um, preserving our culture and our heritage is. I think it's important, especially around entrepreneurship. When we think of this, the Windrush generation, it's about associating them with their resilience their commitment. So many of them leave their homes, you know, behind. And they came to Britain not knowing where they're going to live, not knowing whether they'll get a job, not knowing what the situation is. That takes something. And that story needs to be captured. So people don't think that we're passive people who just come here and just work. It took something to come from somewhere. You have no idea where you're coming to. You know, they've never seen snow. You know, the only story that I hear about Britain is probably something they read in a book. Again, stories that's been handed down. The streets of London is paved with gold, you know? Mm. And so when you get here, you don't even have anywhere to live. You know, people won't even rent you anywhere to stay. So can you imagine what that must have been like? Very traumatic for them, you know, in that sense. And all that story needs to be captured. All the older generation was still alive. We need to capture their story. What was it like for them when they first arrived in Britain? So the younger generation get to understand that, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and all of that, which has enabled them to be. They took jobs, you know, way under their qualifications just to make sure they're able to take care of their families. So that story needs to be shared. Absolutely. And um, as I said earlier, um, we share a heritage. I'm from Jamaica and um, my dad um, came over on a boat and he shared those stories around that. He shared um, folk tales from Jamaica and Nancy stories. He shared all sorts of stories. And I think it's so true what you say. I think that um, coming into an uncertain world definitely builds an entrepreneurial spirit um, and you know, finding somewhere to live. Um, you know, I'm always amazed by my grandmother who managed to buy a house in the in the 60s and 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 kept it going by renting rooms out and um, and and having a little business. So I think it's really, really important for entrepreneurs and to, to find out where they they came from and be inspired by that. What do you think? Absolutely. You know, when you think um, we've never lived in a fair society you know, what's the equal society, basically. Discrimination, you name it, racism, it was there. Very right, you know, Enoch Powell's supposed to be a man of power, you know, talking about no dogs, no blacks, and no Irish. What's that about? You know, you understand, that, you know, 
the, 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 the communication that you pass out is what people hear. So if you are telling your man of power and a leader and say no blacks, no Irish, you know, I mean, no dogs. I mean, what does that mean? You know, society hears that. So you're reinforcing a policy which discriminates against people. And so the banks, again, probably say to themselves, we don't, we don't trust these people. If our leaders are telling us that, why would we then give money to these people? These people, in quotes, right? The Windrush generation. And so they said, all right, then, you won't lend us any money. We'll find our own means. And so they set up their partner system and enable them to throw their money and gather their money and do what they have to do in order to buy homes. And even then they get discriminated against because when they draw their, their, their share and they decide to go to the bank to put it in the bank, the bank then wants to know where they got this money from because there's no way somebody like you could have that level amount of money. So whatever they did, there was never anything um, to support them in that sense. Even I've heard stories where they had to get a white person to actually buy the property for them to enable them to have the houses and then eventually they change the names and everything else. So even if you have the means, there's still structures that are put in place to actually stop you from doing the things that you want to do. Discrimination is a terrible thing. It is. And from that is um, what I hear and I have heard is um, tales of resilience, of um, um, innovation and thinking um, outside of the box, which is great for entrepreneurs, isn't it? Really, that history of surviving and thriving against the odds is something, I guess, with our Ar African and Caribbean entrepreneurs, that history of being able to do that and um, stands them in good stead. And to hear the stories of that is very important. And you help people to turn their ideas into, a ra into reality. So what does it take to turn an idea into reality? Hungry. <laughs> you know, if you're hungry enough, you will make it happen in that sense. So it's focus, passion, and really have a vision that you really want to make it happen. You know, so it could be that you want to write a book. It could be, you know, want to be a change maker. It takes something because, you know, you're going to get some knocks. And there's lots of people who's going to tell you, who do you think you are? Because we live in a society here, which is a class society, you know, only certain people are allowed to do certain things. And then when you raise your head above the parapet and said, listen, I want to be the CEO of a corporation, somebody is going to tell you, yeah, right, okay, how are you going to get there? You know, I'm going to put every obstacle. I mean, I'll get people come to me all the time that have a manager that they said, you know, they want to get promoted. And it's a challenge because that person cannot see you in any shape or form doing that. So again, it's association. People associate you that this is only where you're supposed to be. And there is no way I'm going to support you to go to the next level. I get people come to me all the time in tears, crying, because they have managers who cannot see beyond their color and expect them to be where they are, you know, and we need to understand that whole limitation, that whole limited way of thinking. Yeah, it's um it is difficult, isn't it? And I think um sometimes it's important to not let our our stories um they have to be triumphant, don't they? They have to, we have to share the stories of people who have made it, the people that have decided to um against the odds to be successful and um, I think it's really important to have role models and I think that you help people to be those role models and and share those stories and you you use cards and and proverbs and tell me about that every proverb is really about telling you how to navigate yourself around the system so one of the proverbs is you know when bigger big from bigger and never get rich so what I actually mean is who you surround yourself with is really important. And my mother would always tell me, you know, show me your friend and I will show you who you are in that sense. She always says that, you know, so for me, these proverbs are wisdom and philosophy that's been handed down throughout the generation about how we live our lives as a leader. 
and take ownership of that. But because again, how society is structured, one language is better than the other. So one is discriminated against the other. You know, unless you speak the Queen's English, then people are thinking, oh yes, yeah, standard English in that sense. You know, so somebody, so many people get discriminated because of accents. So many people get discriminated against language that you don't understand. You know, if you don't understand it, you just don't understand it. And it might seem strange because you don't understand it. And it's the same as people. There's a lot to be said about how language is used and how it's discriminated against, you know. So I use proverbs as a way of association to enable people to understand that there's more than one way of doing something, you know, there's another way. So somebody might communicate this way, but it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. Just because you might have an Irish accent or, you know, you have a Scottish accent or you come from a different part of the country, that doesn't make you less educated than anyone else. You just happen to have a different accent because of where you come from. Yes. And I think um, I really like the idea of the cards and um, and you talk about association with an idea. And um, and I, I think, do you think the cards help people to show them a different way? You know, the cards is about connection. Yeah. You know, I have never seen anyone read a proverb or share a proverb and look sad. It's impossible to share a proverb. Once you think in proverbs, you know, it keeps you going. So we talk about your well-being as well. They really kept you going. And, you know, they were created for that reason. It's to enable people, regardless of circumstances that were happening to them, whether it's on the plantation, whether it's at the workplace. If you really and truly think of a proverb, you know, it's impossible to be sad. It doesn't matter what circumstances you find yourself in, you will always laugh. You know, and if I was to see you in the street dawn and I drop a proverb on you and I say something to you in a proverb, you know, you'd automatically laugh. You know, that, that's the whole point. I've never come across anyone who understands the proverb and their power and look sad. You know, so that's the key thing to remember. I agree with you totally. And um, the proverbs that they, the cards have sold really well, haven't they? And how can people get hold of them? Yeah, well, I sold 21,000 because, you know, what people were saying to me, the older generation are passing away. And how do we preserve that culture and heritage? Because those proverbs has enabled them to survive and thrive and create, you know, great things under some serious, serious conditions in that sense. And they always have a proverb. You know, I remember when my parents, you know, they used to gather at each other homes and friends and they would share their stories through their proverbs. And, you know, you'd hear laughter all the way through because it's like, yeah, 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 you know, I did that. And them take bad things make laugh is one of them they always <laughs> say, you know, in that sense. So regardless of what the circumstances, they always see the funny side of things, you know, in that sense. So as a child growing up, you know, we used to hear these stories, these horror stories of how the Bingers generation actually tried in, in this country. And, you know, we definitely need to tell those stories. So, yeah, if you want to find out about it, they're on my website, which is www.onehandcarclap.co.uk. You know, and yeah, that's where all the information about all my work, my leadership development programs I run, and my upcoming retreat in Jamaica, all the information is actually on the website. Oh, that's wonderful. And I will be putting um, all the information there um, on the show notes um, for the show, both on YouTube and on the podcast show notes as well. Um, I always talk to my guests about the importance of taking care of themselves. And um, you combine that um, by talking about the importance of taking care of yourself in order to leave a legacy. Tell me about that. For me, you know, it's the key thing is, as an entrepreneur, you've got to look after yourself. You've got to take care of yourself. And one of them to me is community. Build community around you. Have like-minded people around you. Because to me, I have a group of friends I've known over 45 years. And when we meet, you know, when we have children or when we meet together, you know, we have a good old laugh and share the proverbs. And for me, you know, affirmations, proverbs, find something 
that is important to you, you know, whatever it is that keeps you going, keeps you motivated. Proverbs keep me motivated. I just love Caribbean proverbs and you know, African proverbs, you know, because when I meet people from different parts of Africa and I share a Jamaican proverb, there is a connection and there's an association as well. So yes, the importance of proverbs to me is what keeps me anchored and balanced. So you've got to find something that's important to you, whether it's walking in nature, whether it's reading, whether it's cooking, you've got to find something that keeps you anchored. Your upcoming, upcoming um, retreat, that's about getting back to nature. So that's quite important to you as well, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, being with like-minded people, you know, we got to take time out, come off the treadmill and take time out to look at what works. And it's just ideal because it's in October. So it's coming up to the end of the year. So it give you time to look at, okay, what worked this year? What didn't work? What do I need to put in place for next year? Put that structure in place and having that vision. So if you're a visionary entrepreneur or a leader and you want to move to the next level, one of the things I would say, take time out and just plan what you're going to do next and be clear about that. We'll put details about the retreat in the show notes. Um, it's been so wonderful to have you here. And how can people get hold of you? So I'm on social media. My main one is LinkedIn because for me, it's about being visible. And, you know, my experience of LinkedIn is that I have been out and just being on LinkedIn, people see me and said, oh, yeah, we, we connected on LinkedIn. So, yeah, I mean, as a professional person, I would say LinkedIn is a place to look for me. And uh, my website as well, www.onehandcornclub.co.uk. Fantastic. Is there one thing that you'd like to share with the audience and um, to leave them something actionable about how they can you know and uh, some inspiration to keep them going and to keep them resilient? I would say, you know, be curious, you know, just be curious. One word, whatever curiosity means to you with association. The reason why curiosity is so important to me is that I've learned so much. You know, I see something. I read about it, I'm curious to find out. While I'm doing that, I meet somebody that will take me somewhere else. It's that level of curiosity that, for me, if you're an entrepreneur or leader, it's one of the things I would say, really develop that skill to become curious about everything around you, your environment, people, situation. And yeah, just be curious, keep on being curious. That's so fantastic. Olette, it's been absolutely fascinating and absolutely wonderful to be with you today, hear about your story and hear about your proverbs, about your retreat and everything that you do. You've been an absolute inspiration. Thank you so much for being with us today. And that's it for the Dawn Jarvis Show. And if you have liked what you've heard, please like, share and subscribe. I'd also love to hear your comments about what Lolette has had to say to us today. And we will see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.